So, we are talking about preparing students for solos. So, I just want to take a moment to think about what are the things that really make any kind of solo, whether it's phone or off in the barbican hall, right through to a really well prepared pre twinkle student doing a bow on a song or something. What are the things that make you think there's a really well prepared performance? Just note down a few things each and then we'll go around the room. And it can be as obvious as you like, it's not a, it's not a test about how sophisticated you can be. Pull that with me a bit. Thank you. Posture, up. good posture, excellent. And all that. <laughs> yep. In time with the piano, in tune, good tone, facing the audience, good posture. Accuracy. Accuracy. Uh, sufficient technique to play the instrument. Yeah, good technique. Anything else? Is that on, just on that side? Uh, no, either side. Oh, either side. I, I would say, um, how at ease do you feel as, as the audience? You know, do they, you know, because some, if somebody is not secure for whatever reason, as a member of the audience, you feel stressed. 
stress. You tend to feel a bit kind of, oh God, are they going to get through it? Definitely, you know. But do you think that we've got that with confidence? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. And so may maybe memory memorised should be over yeah. yeah. I wasn't thinking of separating them, but I think it's quite useful. <laughs> Um, right. Anything else? Can we extrapolate a little about good rapport with the audience? What does that actually look like in a Suzuki context? Uh, making sure that you bow before you start playing. No, it's a, like saying the piece. Yeah, bow and introduction. Announcing. Yeah, yeah good. And anything else? I guess just like communication, like with the pianist. Like I know we said like with the piano, but like actually like like oh, the so. feeling that they're like performing together. So if you're playing a piece like Allegro or Allegretto or Andantino or Gossip Gavotte or lots of those, what would you also need to be able to do Me. to make sure that yes, exactly. Me. So leading is going to be necessary at a certain point. And the thing that I would really love everyone to teach very obviously, which is rarely taught obviously, is the, that, that magic moment, I'm just going to write, magic moment after you finished, before the clapping starts. How do we, you know, it would be lovely to think that if you're a good enough performer, then you just get that special moment. But it's manufactured like so much of what we do, right? How do you manufacture that moment where everyone's like, hmm. You don't move. Exactly. You freeze, you don't look at your audience, you don't put yourself back into rest position, and a four-year-old can manufacture that moment if they're taught how to. And then it's no less special for the fact that it's been manufactured and they've practiced it. It's really amazing if you hear a kid who's just done I'm a little monkey, and they get to the end of I'm a little monkey, and, you know, it just makes such a difference. So I think the, the, the moment at the end is something that we can really easily forget about. And it's really important to teach. Right, so this side is sort of a lot to do with what? What, what affects this side a lot? How you draw them. How you how you've taught them? How you've, how taught, you've them. taught them? Yeah, yeah. Their, their overall playing standard. Yeah. Good. Mm. What else? Can you see me? Yeah, no, I can see too. What standards would you use to give piece of credit or say performance with? Mm -hmm. How you've chosen the piece with them? Yeah. Good. It's kind of like both sides of the brain. Like one's more practical and one's more creative. Yeah, yeah but we're talking specifically about this side right now. Okay. How do you? <coughs> So if you think about right your actual your general teaching, so if you have a student who has who is playing how you'd like them to play broadly, will that affect their bow and introduction? No. What? Will that affect whether they play in time? If you've got a student who's playing, who, not that you you haven't prepared for a solo, but like okay, let's say Noel, we're broadly pleased with how she's playing. Will she necessarily bow and do her introduction correctly? No. Mm -hmm. Will she play in time? You can play so. Probably, yeah. Yeah? yeah? Will she play with the piano? Not, yeah, necessarily. not, necessarily. not necessarily. Will she play in tune? Oh, yeah. Yes. Will she play with good tone? Yes. yes. Will she face the audience? Not necessarily. not necessarily. Will she play with good posture? Yeah. Yes. Probably. Will she play with good accuracy? Yeah. yeah. Probably, depends on which piece you've chosen with her. If she's going to play her working piece, will she play with good accuracy? No way. Will she play with good technique? We hope so. Yes. <laughs> will she have memorised it? Yeah. yeah well, it depends on which piece, right? And if you've done it recently. In exactly. Room. So if we're talking about using a Arctic pen on a whiteboard. No. Oh, no, Sharpie? No. No. Oh. Oh, colour. just going to go get it. Is it our last boiling now? Yes, I'm boiling, but I've been boiling for a while. Because <laughs> then you can't see more. Too 
참자 제가 
or you don't make them do that, a lot of these things can fall apart. Yeah? So, then you're, li you're left with the things that you need to teach. You need to choose an appropriate piece. And this goes for not only solo concert, we can like actual public concerts with an audience, but also solos in group, if you want them to really succeed and do a solo in group well. They need to know when it's coming up, at least a week in advance, ideally at the beginning of term, this is your concert, you know, this is your solo date. Um, you need to teach them to do a bow and to do the introduction. When we walk on, if you walk on stage or you go and see someone, let's say you go to see Hilary Marlin in concert, what's the first thing that happens when she walks on stage? She starts and takes a bow. <laughs> Before that, what happens in the room? Everybody, Everybody goes completely mental, right? Yeah. Oh my God, here we are, she's right there! Ah! Yeah, and so she doesn't wait until all that stops and then say, hi, I'm going to play blah, 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 and then take a bow, which is what you see all the time in Suzuki concerts. We bow first because your first bow is acknowledging that your audience have welcomed you. And it's like saying, thanks for having me. And then you tell them what you're going to play and then you get on and play it, you don't need another bow. I've seen so many concerts with three bows in where the kid comes on stage, bows, does their announcement, bows again, gets to the end, bows again, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Um, so, uh, so you come on, you bow to say thank you for welcoming me and then you do your announcement and then you get ready to play. Okay, please teach your children what the composer is called. They're not playing Minuet 3, they're actually playing Minuet by Bach, or actually Minuet 3, Minuet by Petzold, but never mind, we're not going to talk about that right now. <laughs> um, but you know, as long as they're not playing a folk song, they should have the name of the piece and the composer. Um, if you don't do bows in your lessons, like performance bows, I mean, mostly they're the same as the bows we do to start, but you know, I always think it's really interesting. You see quite a lot of students, when I sit through solo concert week, in which I watch almost everyone in Suzuki have to do their solo, it's quite a lot of bowing like this. And I think, so what's happening in the lessons? Are you both bowing at the same time? And you never see that, that's possible, which means you need to practice the bow separately. But you do sometimes need to teach them very clearly, keep your knees straight, look at your feet, you know, don't do duck's bottom. <laughs> How can you practice leading if you don't play the piano or they don't have a pianist? I play the harmony part. Great. Yeah, you can practice, or even you can get them with their mum or dad. You know, can you do a clap when they lead? If they're going to lead after a leg row. And you do, 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 do. Can you get them to go? at the same time. Perfect. If they can do it together, then you you have good leading. If they can't do it together, then you might have bad leading or you might have a parent who's not paying attention. But um, you can work on either of those things. Um, or singing together. Uh, for me, with Allegro, um, you often hear an introduction, which I think is fine because it reminds them of the tempo and stuff. But I think you do think laterally about it. If they have to lead in the middle of the piece, that does mean they could lead the beginning of the piece. So it's up to you and them whether they want to lead with, that, with, with, a, um, with an introduction or not. And, yes. and just make sure, if you have a child who's not ready to lead after a leg row, how can you make sure that that's not going to be a problem in the concert? That is what you think you can do. If they're not ready to lead, um, have the pianist do the introduction? So in the middle of the piece? Oh, oh in the middle of the piece. Of that, yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess you could sort of have like um, get them to count in their heads, sort of how many, oh, I don't know, how many beats. Um, Maybe. The same. If they can't lead it, is the problem going to be the child starting again or is the problem going to be the pianist being with them? Are you, are you talking about the bit where there's the pause? Yeah. yeah. Get them to watch the, lead, the pianist. Yeah, either get them to watch the pianist or get the pianist to go. <laughs> do, do. So if they're looking over that way, which they often will be. Um, you know, that they can still, just an audible cue. So that has to be a group beforehand? Yeah. The, the rehearsal group? Yeah. Lovely. Facing the audience, what has anybody seen? I know lots of you have seen. What's the classic way to make sure that violinists are facing the right way in the concert? 
little ones. Put spells on the wall. Exactly. Give them or put a happy face on the wall. Put give them something to point their scroll towards. I think also to point their shoulders towards, because you know if you say like for example in this room like the performers are roughly where Mimi is, right? You point your shoulders towards the pole, then they're going to understand where to put themselves and when they put their violin up it's going to be in the right place whereas sometimes if you put we we used to put i don't know whether we will this year or not anyway happy face over by the light switch and then sometimes you get them sort of turn towards the happy face right that's where my scroll is going to be and and then they've just kind of done all this weird like twisting around so i think you know aud audience shoulders to the audience or to the pole and then your scroll will be in the right place but also if you're talking about book one students I would highly recommend that you go and set them up before they play, even up to minuets. I mean, even into book two sometimes I've done that. It's very easy to think, well, they've grown up enough to do it by themselves. But then if you think how derailed they can be by just not making sure their left hand's actually in first position and they can play all of minuet one starting on a D sort of sharp. You know, it's, not, it's just not worth it. Like, just be there, smile in front of them, like, oh, don't forget your feet, have you got your best bow hold? Because they're going to be like, ah, there are a hundred people in the room. And, you know, if you can just be right in front of them, calm them down, make them make sure they're set up properly, get them in beautiful playing position, just like you probably do lots of times in a lesson still at the end of book one, and then say, okay, you're going to be great, and off you go and nod to the pianist, then you just really enhance their chances of a positive experience. Okay, so... Uh, what were the other things? Accuracy, so that's really about choosing the right piece and choosing the right piece when. Yeah, really far in advance, yeah. yeah? I mean, at the moment, if you work at Suzuki Hub, you'll know. I am asking all the teachers to tell me what their students are playing for Solo Concert Week, which starts on the 28th of February. And I'm hoping that all of those lessons <laughs> The teacher starts scribbling <laughs> down. Make sure you give that to Kate. I'm going to say I'm on it, but once all my kids are finished with COVID, and I can see them again, <laughs> then yeah. There are extenuating circumstances, yeah. Um, so make sure that you do it far in advance. You don't want to spend the whole lesson on a solo the week before the concert, because if you do that, 90% of what you've done the week after will just go out the window because I'll be a bit nervous. You want to do 10 minutes on the solo for the for the four weeks previous to the concert, each lesson. I, I prefer plan A and plan B, so I do two pieces and say to them, okay, we get to about three weeks out, which one? Because then at least they've got a backup. And if it turns out in the concert that everybody's playing the same thing as them, then it gives them the opportunity opportunity to switch if they But you don't want them switching on concert day. No, no, no. But I mean, I would find out from you, you know, you'd know. Whoever I'm telling... Your confidence is yes. lovely, darling. <laughs> um, I, here, I certainly wouldn't worry about if we have millions of likely ways, we just put them interspersed with other things. Um, but I think that's a very good, that's a very good um, approach to take as long as it does happen three weeks in advance and not a couple of days before. Oh, Kamal's decided he's going to do blah, blah, blah. Oh, has he? Right. <laughs> so as long as it's really clear, this is when we're going to decide by now. And then, yeah, then that's brilliant. Um, and then is obviously to do with how much review you're doing in your lessons and how far in advance you start practicing those solos. But, you know, my students have been practicing their solos for solo concert week in March every practice almost practices for the last week and a half, two weeks. And that will mean that mostly, hopefully, <laughs> that they do really stand out as well prepared because it's it's a little bit really regularly for a long time. It's not a lot for one week beforehand. That's the short term memory that just goes out the window. I think doing that also just um, kind of consolidates the other in their minds that this is something of importance. Absolutely, yeah. It's, you know, if, if the teacher is taking it seriously enough to do it every week. Absolutely. Because otherwise they, they can be a little bit kind of flippant about yeah. it. Yeah, I know. mean, I've seen loads of really very poorly prepared. Yeah. Good students, good students playing very poorly yeah. prepared solos. And that's partly why I wanted to do this exercise, because I think it's really important for us to realise that really well-taught students can perform really poorly. 
And it's not that they're not good students, it's that we have not prepared them for a solo properly. That's a very specific skill. And we're teaching performing arts, right? Because I was going to say, it's this sort of balance between, you know, the Suzuki approach is so nurturing and, you know, acknowledging of them being wonderful and they are capable of doing everything, the sky's the limit. But then you put them in a performance situation and suddenly, actually, you know, that's not quite good enough. Yeah, yeah. And so it's finding that balance, isn't yeah. it, between instilling in masses of confidence that they can do it, but also the... Yeah, the, having really the, high the, standards. The, yes, it's that the thing, actually, you know, actually, I've, I've got to do that. Bit yeah, better, absolutely. Know? And yeah. I think the other thing that works in a very similar way is graduation recordings. My students, if they're going to graduate, we start doing graduation recordings in at least the beginning of the summertime, so they're due July. Uh, we would start to record, and I'm lucky I can play the piano, but we do have speed shifter and backing tracks, so you can, you know, you can do a pretty good job at, let's make a recording, see how it sounds, I want you to listen to it as part of your practice this week and write a list of the things you liked and the things you didn't like. Okay, next week, what are the things you liked, well done, what are the things you didn't like, okay, which one should we work on first out of the things you didn't like? Um, so, was that other app speed shifter and... Just backing tracks. That, that, what I mean is if you don't play the piano, you can yeah. still make a recording okay. with, um, you know, you can, you can record every week for a few weeks in a row. And you know, some of my students, the, the, particularly once they get to level three or four, you know, we've spent most of the time working on that recording. We haven't done it every week, but it's a big project and they understand it's a big project and you talk to them about how if you buy a CD or you download something or you listen on Spotify, that's like 500 takes condensed into one perfect version. But very, very few live performances are good enough from the start to the finish for people to want to listen to them. And this is what we're asking of them, is a performance from, like, from start to finish that is good enough to, to graduate. And that's a big ask, so we're gonna take it seriously and record regularly and get used to it and not splice together, you know, 50 different versions of uh, Far Query. Okay, so how do we teach confidence? Get some physicality on it, so to keep yeah, it no, okay. Is that real confidence or is that projected confidence? It's projected confidence, projected it's confidence. So, we can definitely it. teach them how to look confident. Yeah, how can we teach them to be confident? Right. Give them sort of practice performances. So, maybe yeah. they start with just performing to their parents, their family, toys. Um, yeah, yeah, just sort of like practice performances. Very yeah. good practice performances, and crucially. <clears throat> Practice performing, yes. If you think, yep, 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 and we've still got two weeks to the concert, the chances are your student will feel confident because you've done all of these things correctly. Whereas if you're thinking, I'm still not getting that high three, I'm still having to remind them about that. Oh, they're still forgetting which bow it is after the second time, or whatever, the day before the concert they're going to be worrying about that bow. Mm. So this really feeds into that. And uh, so with the parents as well, I think, I, I mean, I've sometimes explained to them that, that performing and playing are two separate things. Absolutely, yeah. And that you can be a really poor performer, but a really fantastic uh, uh, um, player, but a really player and, and vice versa. Yeah. And I mean, and some of, you know, if you think about the old performers, like high fits, if you listen to some of the recordings of high fits, so many notes were out of tune. But he clearly has this charisma that just like oozes out and his playing is so musical, people don't care, right? But it's like, yeah, he was an amazing performer. Um, but he maybe could only have been a soloist because actually probably he wouldn't have been like dependable enough to be a kind of rank and file player, I don't know. Um, musical, I just want to wrap up because I want to have a little break before the next session. Musical performance, how do we teach musicality? It goes back to that storytelling, doesn't it? Exactly. Tap into so, what it is they want to try and convey with it. Yeah, so that is very much related to that. And again, if you've got all this covered, even if you're teaching Lightly Row, three weeks before the concert, if they're playing it absolutely beautifully, <coughs> Then you can think about, okay, how about we play lightly row, gently bow, or whatever you decide that you want to do with them, yeah? 
Then you can t think about when they're going to breathe. Then you can think about how, you know, the beginning of each note or the middle of each note or the end of each note. Or are they going to come up the scale and do a slight crescendo? Or are they going to do a slight diminuendo up the scale as a sort of surprise? Like all of these things that you can add into even the most basic pieces you cannot do unless you've got this column sorted out. Good rapport with the audience. How can we teach that? Smile. Good, yeah. You really, I mean, so many of them look so just nervous and miserable, bless them. And yeah. you do have to teach a little bit of fake it till you make it, you know. Please do smile, even if you're trembling inside. Often we're trembling inside too. And you've just got a plaster on the teeth and see if you can get through it. And it might make you feel better anyway, because people will smile back at you. Yeah, you can teach, pick up the vowel smile, like when you go to the floor, like, oh, there's my smile, I'm going to pick it up. Um, you know, you can ask them if, if it will make them feel better, they can find out where their parents are going to be sat so they know where to look for supportive faces. Or if they just feel completely panicked by looking out at sea of faces, just tell them to look at the middle of the pole or look out the window. You don't have to actually make eye contact in order to seem like you're still having a good rapport with your audience. Um, Lots of children really love the idea that you imagine the audience with no clothes on if they feel scary. Personally, that's never really worked for me, but uh, lots of them find that very hilarious and it just sort of chills them out a bit. Uh, musical storytelling, obviously if you're talking about very basic pieces, uh, that's not so easy to do, but once you've got pieces that have characters in, you can talk about those characters. Who are they? What are they doing? You know, Lily Gavot, like, oh look, here they're running away. Da -da 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 and then this is the scary bit. Da, 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 da. And this is the cheeky bit. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Uh, and the magic moment at the end literally is just about teaching and practicing with them. Get to the end and count to three before you move, whether your bow's on the string or not. And then the other thing we haven't put here is thank the pianist. I always ask all of them to do it, and it's amazing how many of them don't. And it's a pretty thankless task sitting there playing millions of them. Um, well, whether they're difficult pieces or easy pieces, it's. Um, I mean, how do they thank the pianist? Is that like some gesture to them? So that just you literally say thank you. Oh, just again. Yeah. Just you know, like so. If you're if you're here and you've you've finished your solo and you've counted to three and then the crowd's gone wild and you've given a big smile and taken your bow and just say thank you and walk off. Um, Good. I, I teach my students to look at their fingers when they're playing or something because the, nothing freaks me out than being eyeballed by a child when they're playing. Like they're playing, they're focused on you, and it's like. But it's not about you, babes, it's about them. I don't care, it helps it them. Me out. <laughs> well, get over it. <laughs> it's Pretty not cool. about you. Right, uh, I'm just looking for my phone to take a picture of that. Let's have um, 10 minutes. I've got mine, I can take a picture. Uh, thank you, if we need it on the chat. Yep. Yep. Thanks. <coughs> Excellent.